very first author discussion with Ted Widmer tonight. I'm Jamie Stout, the Director of Membership for the Foundation. We hope that you enjoy this evening and we're working to provide more digital content like this exclusively just for our members. Tonight we welcome author Ted Widmer. He has just released his latest book, Lincoln on the Verge. Ted is a distinguished lecturer at the Macaulay College of the City University of New York and the author or editor of 10 different books on US history, including a two volume set of American speeches for the Library of America. Between 1997 and 2001, he was a foreign policy speechwriter in the Clinton White House. He's a frequent writer on the historical topics for the New York Times and the New Yorker. Lincoln on the Verge, his book, derives from a series of essays on the Civil War that helped, that he had helped to develop for the New York Times, titled Disunion. He also edited the book that resulted from that series. In addition, he's taught at Harvard, Brown, and Washington College, where he's helped to develop programs around the legacy of George Washington. He's been thrilled to have spent the last 10 years on some, focusing some of his time on Mr. Lincoln. So, Ted, welcome. We're so excited to have you tonight. Jamie, thank you so much. I'm really happy to talk to you and to use this new technology and to reach as many people as we can in the world of Lincoln studies. It's a, it's a great world, so thank you. Absolutely, well thanks again. So as we're all sheltering in place at home, reading really is the perfect activity to pass some time. It is. As I, as I read this book, I couldn't help but notice some of the parallels to today's pandemic. Ted, you've written or published a book in a time when our nation was in a crisis, all while currently our nation is yet in a crisis. So you wouldn't have known that writing this book, of course, but how did you come about writing this book? And tell us a little bit more about Lincoln on the Verge. It, it, it does feel oddly relevant, and, and yet you're right. I, I could not have anticipated it. I, I started it a long time ago. I started it 2011. So it took me nine years, and I, I said in my acknowledgments, it took me more than twice the length of the Lincoln administration to write the story of only 13 days. And yet it does feel relevant because it's about a great moral thinker reuniting his country, which has become very divided. And that's how it, 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 it's, it feels like we are very divided today. And, and I wish we had a Lincoln out there to bring us back together. Um, I started it as a kind of, um, historian writing in a newspaper setting. And uh, that, that's why the day-to-day -day approach was so appealing to me. I, I was writing every day a kind of blog-like essay in the New York Times about what was happening 150 years ago for Abraham Lincoln. And I thought a train journey would be good for a blog that needed one post a day. I could talk about here he is in Cincinnati, here he is in Columbus, here he is in Pittsburgh, and add a little local flavor. And then as I did it, I began to fall in love with the story and with the central protagonist, Abraham Lincoln, because he's growing a lot every day, and he's giving better and better speeches. And there was a tremendous feeling of drama. He's, he's also receiving more information every day that the final push into Washington will be extremely difficult and there's a well-organized plot to kill him. And yet he's giving some of the best speeches anyone has ever given, given about how Americans should stay together as a single people. So the drama overwhelmed me and I, I realized after a few of these posts, I've, I've got to write a book about this. Well, it was a great book. I read it. So um, we'll encourage everyone to read it if they haven't already. But um, so the book really takes us on a 13 day train ride, like you referred to. Um, and it was really Lincoln's chaotic inaugural journey. Um, and, and it's different than most Lincoln books. It takes us right up to the presidency, but really doesn't include that. Um, I think you were quoted somewhere to have said this could have been the worst presidential transition in our history. Tell right. us a little bit more about that. Well, Lincoln is so famous now that we forget how weak he was 
as he became president. He, he wins the election in November with only 39.8% of the vote, which is a very low percentage. It's the second lowest in history, actually. So our, our greatest president won with the second worst result in, in history. And after he wins, it gets even worse. Seven Southern states secede. The Republican Party is not a very well-organized party. They've only been a party for six years, and they don't know anything about running a national government. So he's getting lots of advice from people, mainly people he doesn't really want to get advice from. And he's a long way from Washington. He's trying to organize his administration, but he's He's in Springfield, which, um, you know, even with the telegraph, it, it, it was hard to coordinate all of the information flowing around the country about the new administration. And then he's got to get on this train and make it to Washington. As the more I thought about it, the more I thought the, the train is a perfect metaphor to talk about Lincoln uh, growing and and dealing with all of his problems day after day on a train that he can't really get off of and is bringing him closer to power, but also to great danger. So it felt like a kind of a movie to me. Um, I, I, I researched it very thoroughly and there's nothing fictitious about it, but at the same time, it, the story had a tremendous power and, and it just captivated me. Absolutely. It was, it is very captivating. You are correct. Um, I just also want to reach out to the audience. If you guys have questions along the way, I should have mentioned this ahead of time, but go ahead and type it in the question and answers and we'll try our best to get those answered throughout the night. Um, but Ted, going back to what you were saying, um, Mr. Lincoln was really so leading up to it, he was just the least likely person to really be elected, you know, with less than or right at 40% of the votes. Um, and you really described vividly throughout the book that he had a quick wit, but he was also very homely, um, too common of a guy. Some people even said God awful to even look at. He was a slow talking Midwesterner. Um, some of this probably was relatable to some people and made him a normal person, um, but some of it was clearly a turnoff as well, as you stated throughout the book. That's right. Um, how do you think this helped or hindered him along the journey? Well, it, it was both, as you say, um, slick Easterners always found fault with Lincoln. They, they thought he dressed badly. They called him homely or ugly. They had all kinds of ways of putting him down. But one of the great achievements of this long train trip is he, he saw hundreds of thousands of, of people in city after city, huge crowds came out to see him and he forged a bond with the American people that that never ended. I mean, that, that bond supported him throughout his presidency and then it has, has never ceased si since his assassination. So there was something about his awkward appearance that was also pretty good political capital. And I think he must have understood that. His, his body didn't fit very naturally into a, a suit of clothes, a, a formal suit, and yet he was enduringly authentic. Whenever he got out there and stood on the back of the train and talked to the people about his hopes, they knew he was telling the truth, and he needed to build up support. He needed to win over. There were a lot of Northerners who did not vote for Abraham Lincoln, and he needed a unified north because of the possibility of war and he also really needed the border states to stay in the union and that was absolutely crucial kentucky missouri maryland if he if maryland went out which was a real possibility he couldn't even make it to washington to become the president so he's walking along a tightrope and he did it perfectly very good um, Mary Crane asks, did Mr. Lincoln form a bond with anyone on the train that he kept throughout his presidency or even deepen a bond that he might have already had? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, his two young secretaries were on the train, John Hay and John Nicolay, 
and they, I mean, he knew them already, but the, the bond certainly deepened and they, their writing is fantastic for all historians. They, they're both such good writers and I, I depended heavily on, on them. Uh, there's a newspaper writer named Henry Villard that Lincoln knew quite well, who wrote very descriptive posts every day for his newspaper in New York, describing what Lincoln was up to. And I think he and Lincoln had a certain kind of a friendship. There's a really interesting relationship that I, I wish I knew more about, and maybe someone out there will someday find have a breakthrough. But there's a young African-American named William Johnson, who was a kind of steward and hair cutter to Lincoln, but it seems like they were also friends. And unfortunately, there are, there are no writings that I've ever seen from William Johnson, but how amazing it would be to have his story and then he later goes to Gettysburg with Lincoln in 1863 and contracts a, a, a version of smallpox and, and dies. And it, it appears that Lincoln had a, a, a minor version of smallpox that at, at, right at the same time and might even have been in a very precarious health situation in November of 1863. So a year and a half before he was assassinated. Um, after William Johnson died, Lincoln paid for the funeral expenses and handled his escape, estate. So it seems like Lincoln really liked William Johnson. And I, I think that's a fantastic story for some other historian of, of the future. <laughs> that is good. That's good. Um, so throughout the book, you really describe it was an extremely dangerous journey for Mr. Lincoln to be on. Yes, there was. were many, many plots against him, which we'll get into, but it really seems unfathomable for us today to think of, there's not really a security team that goes along with the president, um, yet Mr. Lincoln really didn't have that. So oftentimes he had friends around him um, that were helpful, but they didn't always share the true concerns around um, what might have been happening as well. So I think describe to the audience a little bit more about your research on Alan Pinkerton, Share your thoughts on him, including Kate Warren, the female spy that he worked with. Well, I, I love how important women are to saving Lincoln's life. They, they haven't properly been in the story, I don't think, up till now, and two women are, are crucial. So Dorothea Dix is America's leading mental health advocate, and she's a really great person in the middle of 19th century America, and she goes around all the states, northern, midwestern, southern, saying you need to build hospitals to take care of mentally ill people. You just need better services for them. And she's going through the south in the fall of 1860 after Lincoln has been elected and she's picking, she's, she's friends with people there and she's picking up a lot of intelligence that there are, there's an enormous plot to assassinate him on his way into Washington. And so she goes to the head of a railroad, the, the railroad that connects Philadelphia to Washington. It's called the Philadelphia, Wilmington, and Baltimore Railroad. And she finds this man named Samuel Felton, who's the head of that railroad, and says, there's a huge crime about to happen on your, on your train, and you need to deal with it. And he hires Alan Pinkerton, who's based in Chicago, a Scottish immigrant, but he's successful railroad detective and he comes and meets with this railroad president and accepts the challenge and brings eight operatives with him it's a bit like a mission impossible team and they come into baltimore and infiltrate the bars and restaurants where they think the assassination plotters are hanging out and the most effective there are, there are many effective members of this team but the most effective is kate warney She's a, an Illinois widow, and she's a mastermind of accents. She fakes a Southern accent and um, doesn't quite have a disguise, but she is in a kind of disguise. She wears lapels that suggest con uh, loyalty to the South, and she just hears a huge amount of information about the, the, the plot, and she's the one who is sent to warn Lincoln in New York when his train comes down after go weaving through the Midwest and upstate New York, it comes into New York City. She meets him there and tells him they're they're going to kill you, and that 
changes everything. And that's when they make the plan for him to go through in the middle of the night. So not only did he have threats throughout, um, but he also had some unintentional mishaps and threats that kind of happened along the way as well. Um, I like how you described in the book that there's a local militia that's really lining the railroad tracks, one, to protect the special on its journey, um, two, to also light the way for the train. But even some of those um, so-called friends, there were some like you said, I said mishaps. Um, so tell us a little bit more about those things that you discovered in this it, research. It's like a tragic comedy. The, the tragedy is we all have a sense that, that Lincoln himself had, that he was not going to survive his own presidency, that he was in a way sacrificing himself to save the United States of America. And he, he I, I believe, had that sense even in Springfield on the day he left when he gave that tremendous farewell address. The night before he had talked to his law partner, William Herndon, and, and conveyed his pretty strong sense that he, he wasn't coming back, but he was going to go anyway. So that's the tragedy, but the, there's a lot of comedy too. All these host committees trying to welcome the president-elect. It's the biggest thing that has ever happened to their small town. And time after time, a disaster happens where um, gunfire, ha the, the militias fire their guns too close to the train and shatter the windows. Or in one case, a cannon fires into the train as it's coming into the station. Um, in Xenia, Ohio, a huge lunch is set out for Lincoln and his party. And people get hungry waiting for the train to come in and devour the lunch before Lincoln can even get there. So it's, it, it, it's a country that isn't that well organized for huge celebrity visits. And over and over again, there are, there are hilarious problems and, and Lincoln is amused by them. And, and that, you know, fortunately he had a sense of humor and it served him well and it, it serves the historian well too, who's reading about him. Absolutely. Um, one of the questions from the audience, again, if you guys have questions, go ahead and type those in the question and answers. But one of the questions that's come in tonight is, were the crowds supportive of him? And what type of focus or message did he deliver along the way? They were incredibly supportive of him. They, they came out in, in enormous numbers all in, in both tiny towns on the train tracks and big cities, often much more than the population of the town or city would, would be there waiting for him. I mean, in huge crowds, like 250,000 people were in New York greeting him. It's un unbelievable. Um, and they were very supportive in the North. And one thing I reflect on a little bit in the book is how Lincoln was, I think, the first really big celebrity. He was a funny kind of a celebrity because he was an unknown person, a year earlier. He, he'd been through the Lincoln-Douglas debates, which were something, but they weren't, you know, he wasn't really a household name. He was a, a, a dark horse as a candidate. He was a surprise nominee, and then he wins the presidency, and everyone knows that everything will change, but no one knows very much about him. So as he came through all these towns, there was absolute fascination. Who is Abraham Lincoln? Everyone knew he would be very important to American history, but no one really knew who is this guy. So they came out in huge numbers and they were largely supportive. And I think he really won over a lot of the Northerners. There are a lot of Northern Democrats who vote for Stephen Douglas, also from Illinois. You know, they're good Americans and they think Douglas has a good message. And they're out there in, in the crowds. And there are people way over on the left of Lincoln who are much more abolitionists, who think he's not abolitionist enough. There are people way to the right of Lincoln who think he's a dangerous uh, slave liberator type. And they're all just waiting to hear what he says. And over and over again, he found the perfect words. He said, I'm, I'm gonna be a president for all Americans. I want the South to stay in the country. Uh, we're going to take it one step at a time. And if you don't like me, you can vote me out in four years. That's the beauty of our system. And he just calmed everything down. He was a brilliant 
uniter of Americans. And, and it worked, the personal chemistry worked. So by the time he got to Washington, he had millions more behind him than when he started the trip. That's awesome, that's awesome. So tell us a little bit about the train in, you know, in the book, throughout the book, I could really envision myself even riding along on this train. What does the train symbolize in this book for this time period? Well, I'm so glad you asked because there were two loves driving this book for me. One is my love of Abraham Lincoln and the other is my love of trains. And it's a nerdy thing to admit, but I, I am a train lover. I have a good friend who's a, a train enthusiast and he said they call themselves foamers because they get so excited they start to foam at the mouth when they see a, a train come by. And I, I, I confess to some of that quality, but um, I thought this was a great chance to combine two really big topics. And the, the train is huge in 19th century America. It, it's crucial to immigration. It brings out enormous numbers of immigrants to Springfield and to other communities in the Midwest. It's um, huge for communication and media. Trains deliver newspapers. There are telegraph wires over train tracks, meaning that if you live near a train, you're, you're wired in a sense, in the same sense that we use the word today. And it's really sp speeding up the economy. It's helping new businesses to start. You can start a business in Springfield like Sears Roebuck, for example, started by Julius Rosenwald from Springfield, Illinois, and use the trains and the mail and the telegraph and later the telephone to start a business from anywhere in America. And I talk about a kind of information differential between the North and South and how the South had much less of that. They did have trains, but there, there weren't as many, they weren't as good, they weren't as well connected to each other, often because of states' rights, Southern states would change the, the, the gauge of a track from one state to another, meaning you'd have to stop the train and get on another, sta sta uh, another train at the border. And the North was already way ahead in understanding that trains need to go through. They need to go through long distances and go fast. And so I talk about that in my third chapter and it, it added drama because it's fun to think of Lincoln moving fast in this, in this train. I sometimes thought about the movie Speed with Keanu Reeves about a guy who can't slow down or he'll get in even more trouble. And that's a little bit how it felt to me. But I also really meant it as a serious point about history that the North had become very different. It's, it was as if uh, the internet economy had come to half of America and not the other half. That's what America felt like in 1860. And so it wasn't just slavery. It was also information and communication and transportation. There were two different Americas and, and Lincoln was very much from one. He, was a, he loved trains, he loved the telegraph and he loved information. Yeah, you could, you could really envision that it was really kind of dividing the country even further, um, right. unfortunately, for sure. Um, one of the questions that comes in from Kevin Burke is what range of speed would the train have been traveling in Mr. Lincoln on his trip? And you do describe that a little bit in the book. That's a good question. It got up to and even a little above 60 miles an hour. There were stretches where uh, he could run for a while at 60 miles an hour. And there's some funny moments where his son, Robert Todd Lincoln, got into the cab with the engineers and, and was driving the train. He liked to drive fast. So there's a stretch in upstate New York that's very straight where he, he got it up above 60 miles an hour. Uh, but you, you know, nowhere near the speeds that trains can now go in France or, or China or Japan. In America, we're not quite as fast, and unfortunately, I wish, wish we were a little faster. But, you know, probably between 30 and 60 miles an hour most of the time. 30 when he's going through small towns and stopping and, and, and slowing down, but, but 60 in stretches between cities. Absolutely. So going back to kind of how the um, nation was really divided at the time, you describe a lot of industry starting to be discovered and starting to evolve and ultimately changing the face of the nation, more specifically oil and how it's starting to overtake the power of the South's cotton, really. So tell us a little yeah. bit more about 
that, how it may have tipped the scales in the North's favor? Well, city by city and day by day, I really wanted to look at what made a city special. And I've studied a lot of American history and it's always kind of national. This is what America is going through. It's pretty fun to study what Cincinnati is going through or Pittsburgh or Buffalo. And they're all going through different things. And so for me, they became extremely exotic places like Paris and Rome and Venice. They, they were unbelievably um, interesting and visually beautiful, but also just sort of fascinating places with new ideas happening all the time. And Cincinnati is a center of meat products for a lot of the immigrant families going further west, um, packing of meat and pork and, and bacon and sausage. Pittsburgh is incredibly interesting. Pittsburgh has coal already, but in 1859, petroleum is discovered in northwestern Pennsylvania. It's a, it's a quantum leap forward in energy. And I felt in all the Civil War books that I have read, I'd never really read about oil. Pretty big topic. And I, so I really spent some time with it. And it was a, a godsend for the North that this substance started bubbling out of the earth in Pennsylvania in 1859. It, it helped the incredible production of factories that the North needed for the war effort. So Lincoln is traveling through a country that is divided over slavery and over politics, but is also completely reinventing itself economically. And I thought that was an important part of the story to tell. Absolutely. Um, several questions coming in from the audience about what what was the Lincoln family doing while all of this was happening? Where was where was Mary? Did she know about the potential dangers? Where were the kids? That kind of thing. That is such a good question. Mary Lincoln is fascinating to me. Um, I include a, a negative anecdote and a positive anecdote. And I, the, the negative one is right before the trip starts, um, right before he gives the famous farewell to Springfield on February 11th, 1861. There are a couple sources that indicate she had a temper tantrum minutes before he gave that beautiful speech about loving his hometown, loving Springfield, a temper tantrum in which she was lying on the floor of the room they were staying in, in a hotel, downtown Springfield, and wouldn't get up unless he promised to hire a crony of hers who wanted a job in the upcoming Lincoln White House. And if true, you know, your heart goes out to Lincoln. He's got all the problems of the world on his shoulders and he's got to deal with this. And he does, he always, you know, Lincoln's capacity to carry a weight is incredible. And it, you know, often gave me strength. I, I, I want to say that, and I, I hope listeners will agree that it gives all of us strength in whatever we are going through individually. What, what he went through is beyond what anyone can imagine. But I also think he truly loved her, and I think she truly loved him. And I have a moment where there, she's coming into New York with him, and she smooths out his hair and his appearance and says, you'll do, you'll do. And it's a beautiful moment. And, you know, I think they really did love each other. The, the children are causing a lot of mischief throughout the route, and that's, um, that's a source of, of humor to everyone, and especially to Lincoln himself. One thing Tad and Willie like to do is they go up to strangers and say, would you like to see Abe Lincoln? And the person will say yes, and then they'll, they'll point to someone else, not to Lincoln himself. So there is some you know, good humor on the train in addition to everything else. Those boys, they were always a handful. That's they were. <laughs> so um, Dick Moran asks, um, Lincoln's trip to DC wasn't really a very direct route. Why do you think he chose that, this, this route and did it ultimately achieve the purpose he had hoped for? Great question. Well, as all of you know, if you're from Springfield, there's a much more direct route to Washington, which is you just go toward Cincinnati and then across pieces of Kentucky and West Virginia and Virginia, and then you, you get there. And that, that would have 
taken much less time, but he was uncomfortable going through Kentucky and Virginia. He had not, he'd hardly won any votes. I mean, overwhelmingly lost and, and, but much worse than that, there was real hatred of him in the state he was born in, Kentucky, and in the state his ancestors came from, Virginia. So it was politic to go on a winding route through the Midwest and the North and then to come back down. It was politic in two senses. He avoids Southerners who hate him, but also he needed to meet with governors. And governors were very important then. And if he needed their help raising troops, which he, he would in 1861, he needed each governor to call out troops. That's how it was done. Then, although later in the Civil War, he takes over a lot of that. But at the beginning of the Civil War, he's got to work with governors of Ohio, Pennsylvania, New York, and every, every other state. So it was strategic to visit all of those places and not only hobnob with a governor, but give a, give a speech to a legislature. And it just cemented his relationship with the people of every state who, who he needed to, to get behind him for his presidency. I know you mentioned in the book, um, New York was really kind of a turning point a little bit um, in, in his speeches, and he also had to have some difficult conversations there. Um, a question has come in, how, how difficult was Lincoln's meeting with the mayor of New York? And so just talk about um, how, I guess he had to win them over a little bit more there. It was pretty bad. Uh, the mayor of New York, Fernando Wood, was a complicated, slippery, eel of a politician. And he was sort of throwing out little ideas and speeches that New York might become a free city with equal relationships with the North and the South. And his own personal life was a mess. He just married a 16-year-old and he had a lot of questionable financial investments. So he was the anti-Lincoln. And Lincoln knew that. Lincoln didn't have a lot of patience for a guy like that. But he knew New York City was very, very important. And it was absolutely an enormous. There are between eight and 900,000 people in, in New York in 1860. And with Brooklyn added, Brooklyn was then a separate city. It's you know well over a, a million. So New York is an incredible place in the United States of America with massive immigration coming in, a lot of money and a lot of financial sophistication. And to an interesting degree, some of Lincoln's campaign and the paying for the campaign has been run out of New York City. We think of that as a more modern thing, but you know, people have paid for electioneering, um, paper and posters and you know all the things you need to win the presidency and New York had helped him to win. So he had to be nice to New York also and he needed to win the people of New York and, and he did. So he gave uh, some, some nice speeches in public. Walt Whitman, the poet, sees Lincoln for the first time as he's speaking from a hotel balcony and forms an instant rapport with him and just decides this is a politician unlike anyone I have ever seen. And Whitman's reporting on Lincoln is, is, is a great source of what Lincoln looked like and, and, and sounded like. Um, but you're, the question is correct that Lincoln didn't, didn't like the mayor of New York. They had a brief perfunctory meeting in City Hall where they sort of talked past each other. The mayor said, I hope you will respect the South. And Lincoln kind of ignored the question and said, I hope New York will be part of America because that's what I am. I'm, part, I'm the president of the United States. And I think Lincoln won that debate, um, but they, they didn't really engage. They just sort of talked past each other and then Lincoln kept, kept moving. That's good. Um, so throughout the book, he, he must have given a hundred speeches, it felt like it. Yeah. Um, on his 13-day train ride. Uh, what speech do you feel like was most influential or effective? I love his speech in Philadelphia on Washington's birthday, February 22nd, 1861. Lincoln had the genius to know that Washington's birthday was a great day to say something important to the entire country. And Jefferson Davis is 
active. He's actually been inaugurated. He's inaugurated on February 18th. He had just as strong a claim to George Washington as Abraham Lincoln. He probably had an even stronger claim because of his own family connections and his wife's connections to distinguished veterans of the American Revolution. But Davis said nothing. And Lincoln not only talks about the founding of the country, but he did it in the perfect place. He went into Independence Hall in Philadelphia and said, the Declaration of Independence has inspired me since I went into politics. I've never had a political sentiment that did not derive in some way from the Declaration of Independence. And it's an incredible moment of political theater. It's great theater partly because he's just been warned by Kate Warney that there's a very good chance he will not live over the next 24 hours. So he could just toss in the towel and maybe say, okay, I'm gonna start a government here in Philadelphia and not go to Washington. But of course he doesn't do that. But even with this threat of death hanging over him, he gives this beautiful speech about what America means to him and what it means to everybody. The Declaration of Independence is open to everybody. The word all is the crucial word. Um, all men are created equal. We, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal. They are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And Lincoln says this means all of us. It, it means everybody in America, including people with different racial complexions and different genders. Um, and, and, and so that's a very big statement. And I, I think when he said that, he was already halfway to Gettysburg. He, he goes to Gettysburg uh, in 18, November 1863, so two years later. But the thought is already pretty formed when he gives that speech at Philadelphia just after being told he will be killed if he tries to go to Washington. It's just incredible drama. Absolutely. Um, a couple of our members, uh, Francie and then Bob Willard also has written and they asked about the speech at Ind Independence Hall, um, both saying that was kind of one of their favorites as well. So I'm glad you kind of went into that a little bit more. So that was great. Um, on the train, Dave asks, on the train journey, tell us about how Lincoln noticed some pretty ladies in the front row or on one of the stops and he said, nice ladies and just and but then he felt they had a better deal so well i want to confess to some confusion and maybe ask for some help from future historians because there are two different kinds of stories i kept reading from people in the audience i read a lot of local newspaper accounts it was a great way to people for the first time as he came through a town there are a lot of newspapers in america in 1861 and there's a great website called chronicling america that has hundreds of these newspapers up online and i, I read a lot of them but yes you always get the the account of lincoln as awkward wearing ill-fitting clothes and looking uncomfortable but there are also a lot of accounts from women especially that he was attractive. And those two things don't go together, but I think there was something about Lincoln's physical strength, which was noticeable, and his great skill at speaking that was exciting to everyone, including to women. And I think this may be the first time anyone has said this in, in one of your programs, but I think Lincoln was a hottie to some people. I think he, 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 something was working and I kept reading those, those stories. Very good. Well, there you go. Um, one of the questions that had come in previously um, from Tony, and this was one that I was always interested in as well. Um, you skillfully introduced each chapter of your new book with a quote from Homer's The Odyssey. And he asked, was this device intended to cause your readers to think about Lincoln's Odyssey from the capital city? of Illinois to the capital city of the nation that kind of transformed Lincoln from a regional politician to really more of a national leader? Well, what a great question. It, it kind of answers it, itself. And I would say yes, wonderful question. I, 
I want to ask for forgiveness from readers in a way because it's a lot already to tell the Lincoln story and then to drop Homer on everyone is a bit to ask for, but I love Homer's Odyssey and Lincoln also loved Homer's Odyssey. He read it as a young person. There were copies of the Odyssey handed around the frontier settlements in Southern Indiana where he was growing up and he later, uh, once he once talked about Homer and, and said, he has a good grip. It was a typical Lincoln thing to say, you know, real language. Um, but it's not only that he's going from the, a, a state capital to a national capital, but I felt like he was trying to restore a sense of home. And that's the Odyssey is about someone who's trying desperately to make it home to his family, to his wife and son. He's been away a long time. He's had a lot of adventures, some that he wanted to have happen, some that he didn't. And he has grown as a person, but he really just wants to get back home. And in this case, Springfield is his home. So he's going away from his home, but he, I think he's trying to help Americans remember the idea of the home of what America means. So a country that treats all people equally, that gives people equal opportunity, um, including free people of color, and in the fullness of time, all African Americans. And he's trying to remind everyone, we are a better country than this. The country had, had gotten worse in some ways in the 1850s. And he was trying to bring it back to a more virtuous def definition of what America was. So I think he was trying to create a new sense of home. And that to me felt a lot like Homer in his o Odyssey. There you go, that was great, that was great. Um, Jess asked, in your opinion, what was Lincoln most naive about in terms of what was to come during his president? during his presidency, during this initial ride to D.C.? What was he most naive about, do you think? That is such a good question. Um, I don't think he had a very advanced plan for emancipation when he came in. He's now famous for the Emancipation Proclamation, but he was really working it out one day at a time and he said it, and I think he meant it, that if the South wanted to keep slavery going for a long time, but not expand across the Mississippi River, he was fine with that. He says that in his first inaugural and in many other places. But the problem of slavery was so enormous that it couldn't really be solved in a laissez-faire kind of way. And, you know, I think in the back of his mind, he probably knew that he, he says we cannot in, continue half slave and half free. So I, I think he, he knew that, but I don't think he knew the details of how emancipation was actually going to happen until it happened. And there were, you know, there were other half-baked plans that he tried before the Emancipation Proclamation that just didn't quite work. So, so when he did it, he did it the way it felt right to him. But in 1861, I, I don't think he'd worked out that big problem very, very far. Yeah. Um, a question come back, comes in and it kind of goes back to um, Pinkerton and some assassination. Um, how did Lincoln avoid the assassination attempts in Baltimore and um, the efforts of Pinkerton to really kind of smuggle Mr. Lincoln out kind of in the middle of the night? So tell us a little bit more about that. Well, it was incredibly dangerous. Um, one account says a thousand people were ready to kill him. Another account says 15,000. You know, we, we're just working off the intelligence reports Alan Pinkerton was gathering with his men and women in, in Baltimore. But it was very, very dangerous. They were probably going to surround him. Baltimore had three train stations that were all about a mile apart from each other. So you'd come into one and you'd get into a, a horse and buggy and go to another one. And they were probably gonna surround him in his horse and buggy and stab him and shoot him and maybe throw a grenade of some kind into the horse and buggy. And the police were not on 
the watch that that was clear the police were sympathetic to the south so it was a it was a a, a really bad situation to come through baltimore in the middle of the day and what they worked out was a a a, a secret trip on an ordinary train so they he did not dress up in a scottish outfit the way it was reported falsely by the new york times after afterwards but what he did do is he went with only two people alan pinkerton and his friend his friend ward lamon big strong southerner actually but a good friend of lincoln's who had been in illinois for a long time and with just those two men and then Kate Warney also joined them. Uh, he got on a train in Philadelphia and went through Baltimore all the way to Washington in an ordinary compartment. And it was really incredibly brave of him with almost no protection to do that, to go through a city where a thousand people were ready to kill him. But by going through at four in the morning, he, he made it through. And there, there were even um, in Pinkerton's reports, a lot of signs that there were, even at four in the morning, suspicious activity, people standing in train stations, looking around. And it seems like there may have been people tipping off the South, even from you know Lincoln friends. So it was a very dangerous situation. But he made it, he arrived in Washington at 6 a.m. And I argue that his arrival that morning made everything possible. It made the, the North's victory, it made the survival of the United States as a viable country. And I even think it made our victories in World War I and II possible. If he doesn't get through, we're a very different country at that point. Absolutely. Um, one of the questions that had come in actually about his arrival in Washington, John asks, um, did any of his uh, rivals greet him like Seward or someone who may have campaigned for nomination in Washington, were they there to greet him? So, great question. Um, half of the accounts claim that Seward was there, William Seward, his, his rival for the nomination, but also his friend and his future Secretary of State. Half the accounts say that Seward slept through his arrival at six in the morning and, and wasn't there. And I think that's correct. I think Seward met him not long after he arrived. He went to the Willard Hotel, and I think Seward came in and met him there, but was not actually on the platform at the train station. The only guy we know was there was an Illinois congressman, a really interesting guy named Elihu Washburn, good friend of Lincoln's and an interesting politician in his own right. And I kept discovering these amazing little factoids, but when Lincoln left Washington after his pretty bad two-year term as congressman, he's elected in 1846. He serves from 1847 to 1849. The last night he's in Washington is uh, March 3rd, 1849, and Zachary Taylor is being inaugurated. There are parties, and Elihu Washburn stays up all night with his friend Lincoln, and the last sight of Lincoln is Lincoln has lost his hat, typical, and he's walking up Capitol Hill to try to find his boarding house to, to sleep before going back to Springfield, basically defeated. His political career is over. And then the same guy is there on the train platform when he comes in as the president-elect of the United States. So I, I thought that was a great story. It's a, it's a cute connection for sure. Yeah. Um, so kind of ending, um, you know, not on necessarily the positive note by any means, but um, so Jennifer asks, is, does Ted have any thoughts about the connection or the comparison of the inaugural train to Lincoln's funeral train that also takes that same route in reverse just four years later? So tell us a little I, bit more about that. I do. I mean, that is an incredible story. Um, just the story of that train alone would make a great book. And, and there have been a, a couple, but the amount of grieving that Americans went through, I don't think even the Kennedy assassination or the FDR death, I don't think anything has ever approached the level of grief Americans went through over Lincoln. And it's just so moving to read about an entire town coming out at four in the morning to stand silently while the train 
pass through or the train sliding on the tracks because of all the flowers that had been thrown on the tracks before it. So I write about that in my epilogue. I was tempted to write more about it because I found it so moving, but I had written a pretty long book already. So I only put it in a, a short epilogue. And then of course he comes home to Springfield and in a way, that's another way of bringing the Odyssey in because he really is coming home when he comes back to Springfield. It also resembles in Homer's other great book, The Iliad, the death of Hector, the great Trojan warrior, when people realize our, our country lost a special person and we may never even be the same country we were. That, that's a feature of The Iliad. And I, I felt that in the incredible grief that people went through when Lincoln came home. So it's almost the exact same train route. They, they skip Pittsburgh and they add Chicago, but otherwise it's the same route. And they even would use the same teams of horses, the same actual animals that pulled him when he was alive through certain cities. They find the same animals and pull his casket as he goes through. So there is a, a similarity between the two trips that is haunting. Absolutely, yeah, I found that very interesting. I mean, when you think about it, the actual horses that are still able to do that. Yeah, so. it's only four years. Everything he achieved happened in only four years. It's incredible. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, some questions are coming in. People are just really loving the book and they wanna know um, how long did it take you to write it? Did you learn anything new, discover any kind of fast, you know, fascinating facts that you didn't already know or what was frustrating along the way of writing the book? Well, thank you. I, I wanna apologize for how dark it is in my room. We're, we historians like to sit next to our bookshelves. It makes us feel more adequate and um, Unfortunately, the lighting is very bad in my library room, so I, I apologized. But, um, well, I, I work so hard on this book and I appreciate your kind comments. They mean a lot to me. I went somewhere very deep where I, I have never gone before. I've written some other history books where it was a kind of um, fact-finding exercise where I would look up facts and put them into a book. And this one was emotional. I felt the... Uh, the grandeur of of Lincoln and how great a man he was and the pretty certain knowledge that he was not coming back. When he says goodbye to Springfield, I feel that he knew he was not coming back and yet he did it. He sacrificed himself for our country and for all democratic governments everywhere because democracy was not doing well in 1861. And after he saved our democracy, a lot of other democracies looked to America and, and did better. So I wanted to honor Lincoln and do really deep research and I, I did, I spent eight years. So I started in 2011, I finished at the end of 2019 and it's only now <laughs> coming out. and. I just read tons of local newspapers to figure out what Lincoln looked like physically to people. I read every one of his speeches over and over and over again. I read every memoir by every person on that train or any politician who ever came into contact with him. So yeah, I went somewhere pretty deep. I, I, I sort of lost touch with 21st century reality for a while and I felt like I was living on the train. And if you feel like you're on the train moving, that was my goal. And I wanted it not only to be, what does Lincoln look like to people waiting as the train comes in and they see this awkward looking guy come out and speak, but I also really wanted the book to capture what America looks like to Lincoln. So he's looking out the window at a very complicated country and seeing smokestacks and farm fields and rivers that he's crossing. And I, I wanted to capture the beauty and the complexity and sometimes the darkness of America. So if it succeeds, then I'll, I'll be really happy. I wanted the reader to go for a ride in, in 1861. Absolutely, oh, well, I felt it. So you did that for sure. Yeah. Everyone here is saying great read and they're looking forward to- Thank you, Jamie. Them too. So they really appreciate it. 
Um, one question that comes in and it kind of goes into today's world, in your opinion, why does Mr. Lincoln still fascinate the American public? He really does more than anybody. You know, Washington was great, great general and a great president, but he's not quite as fascinating. And part of it is the beauty of the language. So Lincoln is our greatest speaker. He's the greatest writer of speeches and deliverer of speeches in our history. His, his words are inexpressibly beautiful. Where he got that literary gift, nobody quite knows. He, he didn't go to college. He didn't have a whole lot of education. He used words more dexterously, more beautifully than any other president in our history, by far. I, I, I would say. Another piece of this mystery, I think, is the sadness that is inside of him. And we want our presidents to be happy. We generally vote for charismatic, happy, smiling politicians. We all know the type. Lincoln isn't that kind of a person. There's a great sadness inside of him. Maybe it's because of his mother's death or his sister's death or the death of Anne Rutledge, or other disappointments. Maybe he had an unhappy marriage, or maybe he had a happy marriage. It's hard to, hard to know. Um, later, the um, inexpressible tragedy of the loss of his son, Willie. But that's after this trip. Um, anyway, but the sadness is in him. And there are fascinating accounts by people sitting right next to him saying, I mean, we now use the word bipolar, and it, it means something specific, and I'm not sure it quite applies to him, but something similar is going on where he would change very quickly. His face would look as if he had all the sadness of the world inside of him, like he couldn't even take a step, and that's what a deep depression feels like. You can't move. You're, you're imprisoned by your depression. And then there would be a twinkle in his eye and he'd tell a funny story and he'd make the room laugh and he'd make himself laugh and he'd come back. And that's fascinating and strange. And there is a strangeness to Lincoln that is not really there in our other political leaders. And I love that about Lincoln. He's, he's a mystery because of this strangeness. Absolutely. People from all around the world visit the library museum all the time. Um, I say that all the time before I started working here. You always can appreciate it being from here, but sometimes we take it for granted if we're here in Springfield, Illinois. Um, but yes, people from all around the world love him, admire him. You can go pretty much anywhere and there's always a Lincoln connection or a Lincoln statue or quote or something like that. But um, just one, we have so many questions we could be going on forever, but try to wrap it up here in, in an hour. Um, and again, people are just really saying thank you for making the journey come alive and really like that. Well, I'm um, so grateful to all my readers. And actually, maybe I'll just, I'll give you my email. And if people don't get a chance to ask a question, welcome to email me. It's um, Ted underscore Widmer, my last name, W-I-D-M-E-R at brown.edu where, where I used to teach. And if people want to email me, I'll, I'll happily answer questions. Absolutely. And we can always put that in the email that we send out after this. So okay. again, Ted, we just really want to thank you so much for sharing your passion about Mr. Lincoln, um, and giving us a glimpse into your new book, Lincoln on the Verge. So audience, I'm asking you to do yourself a favor um, by go purchasing the book. Um, at your local bookstore, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, wherever books are sold, uh, do yourself a favor. It's a great book, um, and you'll, you'll learn a lot, and you'll just enjoy yourself. Like I said, you'll feel like you're riding on the train. So again, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. Thank you for your membership um, to the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library Foundation, and like I said before, we certainly look forward to offering more of these opportunities for you as our members, and Again, thank you so much, Ted. We really appreciate it. Yeah, con congrats to you for doing this new leap into the, into the technological future. I, I, I think Lincoln would have admired your courage, and it, it was really fun. And thanks to all the readers. I appreciate it. Thank, thank you. If nothing else, it certainly taught us to be, you know, pivot and uh, be yeah. resilient, for sure. So yeah, absolutely.
We appreciate it. And again, thanks everybody. We appreciate it. Good night. Okay.